Good morning and thank you for joining today's webinar. We will be getting started in two minutes. Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We are ready to begin. Today's webinar is eligible for one contact hour. Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing is accredited as a provider of continuing nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The speakers and planning committee members have disclosed no conflicts of interest. To receive contact hours for this CNE session, participants are required to attend the webcast and complete the evaluation form, which will be emailed to all attendees approximately one day after the webcast. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. Following the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. You'll see on your GoToWebinar control panel that you can send a message through the questions feature. This is where you can type in any question you'd like to post to the presenters. Be sure to hit send so that the message makes it to us. To practice using this feature, please submit the state or country you are from. We would like to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise with us today. Our speakers are Dr. Megan Lippi and Dr. Sarah Kaler. Dr. Lippi is an assistant professor and life researcher at the University of Alabama Capstone College of Nursing. Dr. Lippi's area of, in Dr. Lippi's area of research focuses on palliative and end-of-life education. Dr. Lippi has published works in areas related to palliative care education, instrument development, simulation, and social justice. Dr. Sarah Kaler is an assistant professor at the University of Alabama Capstone College of Nursing in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Her areas of teaching expertise include health assessment, fundamentals, and nurse case management. Her research interests center upon innovations in teaching, learning, and curriculum design, and the role health wellness behaviors play in promoting living, learning, and work environments. She is a past scholar in the Nurse Faculty Leadership Academy. We are so excited to have you both with us today. Now let's get started. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Lippi. Thank you for joining us. For some of you, this is a very early morning, so we appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. We wanna, again, reiterate that you are eligible to receive one contact hour um, by completing a, an evaluation after this survey, and we have no conflicts of interest. Our objectives today, we want to begin by describing different types of grief from a nursing student perspective. We'll then identify strategies for responding to loss amidst this COVID-19 pandemic. We'll talk about how we can develop mechanisms to prioritize competing challenges and uncertainties, and then explore methods to ensure continued academic success in a time of unpredictable change. Before we begin, I wanna orient ourselves to what we are going to discuss. This presentation isn't meant to be another lecture. You are getting plenty of those. We want this to be a time of intentional reflection as such, we've chosen for our slides to be mostly images. Let's use this time to take a pause and reflect on where we are in the midst of change and uncertainty. I wanna start with a story to relate 
that might relate to your personal or your academic life. Pictured here is a before picture of the old Chulateca Bridge built in 1937 in Honduras. In 1996, a Japanese company began building a new bridge, which came to be known as the Bridge of the Rising Sun. They finished this bridge in 1998, but then tragedy struck Honduras. No sooner had the bridge opened for use, Honduras was hit by the powerful and destructive Hurricane Mitch, which is recorded as the second deadliest Atlantic hurricane in history. What a tragedy. However, the biggest surprise of all was that the new Chuleteca Bridge survived with only minor damage, but the roads at both ends of the bridge were completely washed out and nowhere to be found. Incredibly, the bridge itself remained in near perfect condition. However, more impressive than that, the Chulateca River, which is several hundred feet wide, had carved itself a new channel due to the massive flooding and now no longer flowed beneath the bridge. This bridge quickly became known as the Bridge to Nowhere. Just like the engineers who build this bridge, when we started off the year and semester in January, no one could have predicted the storm that has disrupted and continues to disrupt our personal and professional everyday lives. Our new normal has carved itself different channels and the bridges that once were functional no longer serve their original purpose. As a student, it can feel like change is flooding in Nothing about this semester of nursing school is the same as what you envisioned in January. The remainder of your nursing program is unclear. I want to share with you some of the perspectives we're hearing from our students and from students from around the country at this time. Classes have transitioned to an online learning format in a very short time frame. Students are being asked to engage in new types of learning activities. Some of this feels like busy work. Responding to this rapid change is overwhelming for you and for your faculty members. Many of you had clinical hours canceled or moved to an online format. Some of you missed out on clinical experiences you were looking forward to. Watching a birth, rotating through the intensive care unit, caring for clients in the community, Instead of learning at the bedside, you are now having these clinical experiences virtually, while some of your peers got to be in those clinical settings. It just doesn't feel fair. Due, to feel, due, um, due dates may feel like a moving target. Your faculty members update their plans, but then they change again. You want clear direction, but sometimes you feel like you are getting too much information to process. Maybe this information is conflicting. Your faculty aren't doing this on purpose, and you know they are doing their best to make this learning meaningful for you, but you just wish due dates were set. How many more times can you erase and rearrange your planner? What will school look like this summer, this fall, next year? When will the curve be flattened and we can resume life as it was? Will nursing school ever return to how it was before? Your friendships have changed. The study groups you formed may have disbanded, or you're now trying to study in new ways. Talking through Zoom just isn't the same as meeting at the local coffee shop to concept map and quiz one another. The trips you've planned with friends, the social events on campus, the sporting events, they've all been canceled or postponed. Even your relationships with your faculty members have changed. Talking through email or virtual meetings just isn't the same as coming to your faculty member's office for help and advice. Outside of the academic realm, life is constantly changing. You've been forced out of campus housing, but you've left your belongings behind. When can you get your things? Maybe you're back home and feel like you've lost your independence. Not only are you home, but your parents and siblings are all home too. For those of you who are parents yourselves, you find you're now trying to navigate additional roles and responsibilities. 
You don't have the same privacy you've come to enjoy with living on campus. Some of you may have lost your jobs in the recent economic uncertainty. You are trying to figure out how to pay your bills and at the same time, schoolwork still calls. All of these changes can be overwhelming. These haven't come slowly. They've been dumped on each of you in a very short time period. At times, it feels like you're trying to drink a sip of water from a fire hose. You try to put on a brave front outwardly, but inside your mind is racing with all of the unknowns. Throughout the world and nation, the need for healthcare workers at the front lines is the focus of much media attention. You chose nursing because you want to be a nurse. Some of you just started your professional coursework, while for others of you, the end is in sight, but a semester or more away. This poll to be at the front lines can create its own uncertainty. Do I still want to be a nurse knowing what is happening in healthcare? Why can't they just let me start working now? I know enough and I can help. Let me join the workforce. Wherever you are on this spectrum, the reality of what's happening in healthcare is impacting you. That discomfort you're feeling, all these rapid thoughts going through your mind, this is grief. If you can name it, you have a better chance of managing it. People are feeling a number of things right now. The world has changed. And while we know the pandemic itself is temporary, it doesn't feel that way. And we realize the effects of it will make things different from here on out. In times of fear and change, people want answers. You want answers and guidance. Your future patients want answers. And who do, the, who do they look up to for these things? You are looking to your faculty. Your future patients will look to you. At times, you feel caught in this unending abyss of uncertainty. I want to spend a little time talking about loss and grief. As I said, all these thoughts that might be going through your mind, this is, this is loss, this is grief. So loss is this absence of an object, position, ability, or attribute. What are those things you feel you have lost? Some of you in undergraduate programs may feel that you've lost your college student rights. College is for making memories and celebrating. There aren't any clear indications of when we will see a flattening of the curve. Life may feel as though it has lost all predictability. For everyone, the world is changing daily and we've all lost our sense of normalcy. And all of these losses are hitting us hard and we are grieving. Grief is our reaction to a loss. So I want you to take a moment and think about how you're responding to your losses. Every person is going to be managing their losses and grief differently. So what are you doing? Are you reaching out? Are you turning inward, shutting down? Does it depend on the day and time? Grief is normal, but we also know that grief looks differently for everyone. I love this painting by Salvador Dali called The Broken Bridge in the Dream. We are all on an uncertain path right now and the other side seems very far away. Throughout this image, we see different depictions of how people are transversing this broken bridge. I wanna briefly review the different types of grief you may be experiencing. As I describe these types of grief, spend some time reflecting on what you are feeling Use this painting as a way to explore the different thoughts and emotions that surface as we explore grief. Normal grief is normal feelings, reactions, and behaviors to a loss. These grief reactions can be physical, emotional, cognitive, or behavioral. There's anticipatory grief. This is grief that occurs before a loss. It's that feeling we get about what the future holds when we're uncertain. We know something bad is happening, but we can't see it and we can't visualize it. So this breaks our sense of safety and we feel that loss. Acute grief is brought on by a sudden and unexpected loss. The COVID-19 virus has changed the world suddenly. 
We weren't prepared for this, but the reality is now it's happening. Delayed grief is associated with reactions to the loss that are postponed. We might be consciously or unconsciously avoiding our losses. Maybe some of you don't feel much different. Maybe you're avoiding the news and social media because you don't want to think about COVID-19. Complicated grief is complex and involves many components. There's a sense of disbelief regarding the loss. Individuals feel anger and bitterness over the loss, and there are recurrent pangs of painful emotions with intense yearning and longing for what was. Finally, there is a preoccupation with thoughts of the loss, often including distressing, intrusive thoughts related to the loss. We have what's known as disenfranchised grief. This is grief encountered when a loss is experienced and cannot be openly acknowledged, socially sanctioned, or publicly shared. As a student, you, might, we are, feel, you are feeling losses. There's no question about that. But this isn't a loss of life. This isn't a loss of some of those things that are broadcast throughout the media. So are you allowed to feel these losses? Are you allowed to say that you're having a hard time? That's what disenfranchised grief can feel like. And then there's cumulative grief. This is when you start experiencing a second or even multiple losses before you've begun to process and grieve the initial loss. Over time, these multiple losses lead to a feeling of grief overload. We know from the world of palliative care that experiencing multiple patient deaths without taking time to grieve and mourn can lead to compassion fatigue. Some of you may be feeling overwhelmed or like you are starting to shut down. We've all experienced lots of change recently. How have you taken time to grieve your losses? Or does it feel like the hits keep coming without any reprieve? So based on the descriptions provided, which type of grief do you feel best represents what you are feeling at this time? We're going to deploy a poll here. And what we'd like for each of you to do is select the grief that you feel resonates most with how you're feeling right now. All right, thank you for your responses. So it looks like we're across the board. Some of us, most of the majority, although it's a small majority, feel normal grief. And then we're seeing acute, cumulative, complicated, disenfranchised. Maybe some of you, those other grief choices were the ones that you wanted to pick, uh, but we were limited to five. So sorry if that wasn't your answer choice. I just wanna say all of these grief, all of these options, are expected. No person grieves the same way. So if you're in a different category from somebody else, that's okay. Grief is a normal part of life that we don't like to think about, but it can feel very differently for each person. So as we return to the slides, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. As I said, everyone has different losses different responses to loss, and different languages of grief. Each person is going to engage in grief work differently. So where are you with your journey in grief? Processing our grief is a challenge. Much like competing in a triathlon, there are different obstacles along the journey to the finish line. Everyone has a different pace. Some people will excel in one aspect of the competition, but fall behind in others. The important part of grief and coping is to keep trying and to not give up. Grief is displayed with physical responses, nonverbal and verbal reactions, and physical activities. Grief is influenced by internal, interpersonal, and external pressures. 
How have you coped with grief before? What did you find helpful to care for yourself and navigate grief? Consider deploying these strategies to help you navigate the thoughts and feelings you have in this time of uncertainty. Do you prefer to engage in written journaling or reflection? Do you need to talk with trusted others to help process your grief? Do you need to engage in physical activity to help process the thoughts and feelings you have? How do you use your social network to support you? What cultural and societal expectations influence how you respond to grief? For many of us, this includes your faculty. We all feel as though we've had to dive right into, um, into moving forward. We have jumped off a massive cliff without knowing what lies in the water below us. While this has been a necessary response to the challenges we are facing, we need to take a step back and start to equip our coping skills. Coping is this process or strategy of managing the situation in which grief places us. There's a theory that I think really helps us consider where we're at with our grief right now. The dual process model of coping with bereavement tells us there are two processes in coping with loss. We have to oscillate back and forth between these two orientations before we can successfully cope and move forward. Loss orientation refers to the person's concentration on appraising and processing of some aspect of the loss experience itself, and as such incorporates grief work. It involves a painful dwelling on and even searching for what has been lost. This lies at the heart of grieving. Restoration orientation refers to the focus on secondary stressors that are also consequences of grieving, but they reflect a struggle to reorient ourselves to a changed world without the things that have been lost. Rethinking and replanning one's life in the face of grief is also an essential component of grief work. I submit to you that many of you may have jumped head first into a restoration orientation. You've had to rework your plans and schedules. You're trying to figure out the new normal or the new plan. However, we haven't taken time to process our losses. That's what I hope you'll start to do in the days ahead. Take some time for yourself to think about what you have lost. Allow yourselves to feel the emotions that you've maybe been suppressing or avoiding. Let yourself be vulnerable for a little bit and do the ugly crying if you need to. When we allow ourselves to engage in both loss and restoration orientation, we can begin to make incremental movements toward coping with our losses. We can grow. Research tells us that we can experience two types of growth following a loss. Personal growth during or following a perceived loss implies a person becomes more resilient and understanding of themselves, as well as gaining heightened empathy towards others. Post-traumatic growth helps promote positive changes in ways of relating to others, developing a new understanding of ourselves as stronger and more capable. We initiate new life adventures and gain more satisfaction with our sense of spirituality and existential issues. One important means of achieving this growth is mediated by social support. We can't do the work of grieving alone. We need help. We need to be supported. So who is supporting you now? Is it your family, your friends, your faculty, or are you struggling to find that support system at this time? Many of you might have been introduced to Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. I want us to think about that a little bit. We've learned five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Recently, Kessler added a sixth stage called meaning. I would imagine that most of us are not in a place in our grief work where we have found meaning from this. All of us are in different stages of grief. And with thinking back to the poll that we took, everyone was at a different place. 
which might suggest that we're all at these different stages of grief. We won't progress through this linearly. We will go back and forth between all these different stages at all of these different times. We might be feeling denial, feeling like this is only temporary. The university may still change their plans and we may be back on campus soon before the end of the semester. They might be feeling anger. You have worked so hard to make it into the nursing program and you're wondering, is this how I'm supposed to learn how to be a nurse? You may be bargaining. Maybe if I start working now at the bedside, then things will get back to normal faster. Depression. You might be saying, I am sad and stressed and I miss my old life. Acceptance. What are my options? Let's get busy. There might be moments where we find ourselves in this stage, but then there's other moments when we find ourselves in the other stages of grief. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Kaler, to tell us what can we do to help us get through our grief. Thank you. It is good to be with you this morning, and I want to introduce to you this concept of resilience and how can we foster resilience within ourselves, but also how can we help each other foster resilience in others? First of all, like defining resilience, we talk about this as the ability to bounce back. We want to be adaptable to stress and adversity, and we don't want to just survive, we want to thrive after being involved in these particularly stressful situations. And right now, the effects of this pandemic are definitely stressful. Resilience has been defined in the past as a characteristic, as a personality trait, um, it's also been defined as a quality that people can inherit and develop. Resilient individuals tend to in exhibit an internal locus of control. These are the people in your life who demonstrate empathy and have that positive self-image and optimism. We also know that resilient individuals tend to be more open and more accepting of change and are well suited to managing those daily responsibilities despite the adversity that's going on in the world. So how do you develop this resilience that is so desirable? Well, there's several factors that have been identified as crucial for the development. Um, most of these are protective and are inherent. So they are within you and they are lying within yourself. Um, these inherent traits can serve to defend you as the individual against adverse effects. Um, a lot of these are related to your coping strategies and your coping mechanisms um, with emphasis particularly on the strategies, skills, and techniques that you employ to deal with stressful situations. Um, so it's also been shown to um, help develop personal strengths um, that overcome trauma and stress. So in navigating this turmoil in this tumultuous time, um, I think it's important, you know, we've talked a lot already about loss. We've talked a lot about the different types of grief, but I think it's also important for us to identify and address something else that's lurking under the waters. Um, and that's anxiety. I think it's natural during these times of uncertainty to find our minds wandering to the worst case scenarios and those worst case images. In fact, I think it would be unhealthy to ignore these anxieties altogether because that just would create a repetitive case of unhealthy denial that Dr. Lippy was talking about earlier. Instead, I think the goal here is to find a balance. Um, find a balance in the things that you are thinking about. So if you find yourself kind of feeling the sense of negativity that's weighing you down, take a moment and have a conscious effort to be equally seeking out the positivity that surrounds you daily. We've also talked a lot about anticipatory grief, and that's where your mind goes to the future and imagines the worst. Um, I think, you know, again, that's very natural. And I think that's something that we all are guilty of doing many times in our lives, not just during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. But my, let's be mindful. To calm yourself, you want to be mindful of the present. So how do you do that? 
when you find yourself kind of going to the future and imagining the worst, take a moment and be conscious of those thought, that thought process. Um, find five things that are immediately surrounding you. This could be your computer. Um, it could be a table lamp. It could be a photo in a picture frame. It could be a window to the world. It could be your chair. But focus on these five things and take a moment to just breathe. Realize that in the present moment, nothing you have anticipated has happened and that you are okay. You have food, you are not sick, you are present, you are breathing, and you will move forward out of this moment. I think it's also important to assess your current activities, both personal and academic, and learn to prioritize what needs to be done, what is nice to get done, and what you can let go of. Because obviously we want to let go of those things that we cannot control. So as we continue to navigate through these unknown and uncharted waters, I think it's important to be mindful that everyone is going to have different levels of fear and grief and that their fear and grief is gonna manifest itself in different ways. So you might have a, a peer or friend who is a little snippy with you, or your faculty member may seem a little distant. Practice patience, practice compassion. Take into consideration who that person usually is and not who they seem to be in the moment, because it's very likely that their behavior is the outward expression of their own internal fear and anxiety. And then lastly, for those of us who have tried several strategies, yet continue to feel overwhelmed at times, my advice to you here is just keep trying. Put a name to what you are feeling and share that with those who are around you. I think it's perfectly fine to let your faculty know that you are having a tough time today. Um, I think it's also okay to be vulnerable with your friends and your parents and let them know that you are struggling in the moment um, trying to balance all these multiple and competing challenges. Whatever it is, put a name to it. Acknowledge what you are feeling so that you can channel the emotion into motion. And that's what ultimately is going to lead to empowerment. So finding your path, because right now it feels like life is at a crossroad. Everything is moving and swirling and changing, um, but sometimes we feel like we might be stuck in a holding pattern. How do we get out of that? How do we move forward? Um, one thing I would say is look, look at your leaders. Pay attention to those who are in positions of leadership who you admire or your role models in life. Notice how they are preparing themselves to lead during this time of crisis and start following in their footsteps. Um, I think one of the first things you can do to do that is to ground yourself. Um, do this by making the conscious effort to not participate in the drama. We know there is a lot of information floating around right now, and a lot of it's coming at us from many different sources. We've got the news, which is always negative, it seems like. We've got social media where people are circulating memes like never before. We've got marketing who everybody's now suddenly trying to get us to purchase these products that's gonna make our life easier during quarantine. Some of this is very accurate information, but most of it is not. So be careful to not get caught into the drama. Instead, focus on being the person you want your peers to be, you want your future patients to be, and focus on being that person now more than ever. Be innovative, be thoughtful, be calm. When you can, point people to something that is larger than themselves. The truth of the matter is things will get better with time. And until then, we need to do whatever it takes to get, to get us there. So rather than feeling paralyzed by the uncertainty, I challenge you to utilize your ingenuity to create solutions to your new problems. You are more technologically adept than any other prior generation. So how can you use technology to help in this crisis? 
Let's talk about staying connected because we know that the semester ended abruptly. Celebrations and end of the semester hoorahs are no longer happening anymore. How can you and your friends stay connected? And with this connection, I'm not just talking about the occasional Snapchat or TikTok video, but instead, how can you have meaningful connections with your friends? How can you maintain the friendships that in the future are going to be colleagues? How can you maintain these even though your goodbyes were altered? I think that goes along also with finding and seeking out the joy. We've talked about how fear and negativity are just around us in the news and it's being plummeted at us from multiple directions. Um, take time, find the joy. What are the positive things that have happened to you each day? What are you excited about? Um, when you find yourself getting bogged down in that negativity, take a step back and find something that is equally positive in your life. Self-care is critical. Self-care is one of my favorite things to talk about. And so I kind of end up harping on it more than anything else. But here we are. We have come to the day where we are in the midst of creating our new normal. I think anytime we embark on something that's new, we also have to take a moment and just be kind to yourself and allow yourself to fully appreciate the range of emotions that simply come with starting a new chapter. Part of this transition for you means gaining a little bit of professional maturity and having to do some adulting. I know that word is terrifying. Adulting is terrifying even for me, and I like to consider myself partially adult. Um, it's apparent now that your academic career is fully within your hands, and what you put into it is what you are going to get out of it. Let's be honest, though. That has always been the case. But now that you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction with your peers or your faculty who kind of serve as that accountability partner, it's easy to feel like you are on your own or that you're teaching yourself 100% now. You are not alone. You still have a resource toolkit. It's just now it's up to you to know what you put into that resource toolkit. So here's my advice. I think that a sense of normalcy comes with a sense of routine. You know, when you were on campus, you were you kind of had established yourself a good routine, at least by now. I recommend you develop a daily schedule for yourself and try to keep it as close to how it was when you're on campus as possible. Wake up at a reasonable time in the morning and after a cup of coffee or a moment of veg time, uh, get up take a shower, get dressed, and begin your school or work day. One of my favorite work from home tips is what I call the 50-10 rule. So I will set myself a timer for 50 minutes and go to work. And I love that 50 minutes because I tell myself, you can do anything for 50 minutes. So turn off all your distractions, put your phone away, get off social media and focus for, 15, for 50 minutes. And then whenever that timer goes off, you are done. You have 10 minutes to do whatever it is you want. And if after that 10 minute time frame, if you are motivated to go back to work, reset that timer for 50 minutes and do it again. If after that 10 minutes, though, you are done mentally, you have hit the wall, then give yourself permission to be done. Because anything that you are trying to do um, when you're trying to force it is not going to become genuine. It's not going to be real. It's not going to be productive. I recommend building into that daily schedule little small goals for you to accomplish. So, for example, in the morning, you can say, I'm going to set a timer for 50 minutes. And in that time, I'm going to complete my study guide for this one particular med surge model. And then in this afternoon, I'm going to set a timer for 50 minutes. And during that time, I'm going to review my cardiac medications lecture. And then you do that. Once you have met those little small goals for the day, reward yourself and your productivity and say, you are done with work for the day. You can move on with your life. I encourage you to build into your schedule time for a little bit of exercise. We know cognitively the benefits of exercise. We know that exercise releases endorphins. And now more than ever, we need a boost of endorphins to help our bodies physically as well as mentally. 
So your exercise can be anything. Schedule a 30 minute walk around the neighborhood at the very least. I mean, get outside. Despite social distancing, you can still get outside. Breathe some fresh air, catch some sunlight. It will do wonders for your mood, your motivation, and your spirit. So also, I think that kind of brings up something to mind. Um, on the topic of social distancing, uh, as a nursing student, I think the greater society associates you as a member of the healthcare team. So as such, you are now in a position of influence and leadership. Use this position wisely. Are you role modeling appropriate behaviors right now when it comes to social distancing and stay at home mandates? Think about how that relates to credibility as a healthcare professional. Um, I often use the example of a nurse who just came back from a smoke break and she's reeking of cigarette smoke. And now she's going to go into a patient's room and start teaching about smoking cessation education. Like how credible is that nurse's message? Likewise, now is the time for you to be modeling healthy behaviors during this time of pandemic. Share within your circles, your peer circles, your faculty circles, even within your own family. Share within these circles the creative ways that you are staying physically healthy, mentally engaged, and whatever it is during this time of quarantine. Lastly, take care of yourself. Eat your veggies. Give yourself some self-love. Uh, get plenty of sleep. Drink water. And be kind to yourself. I think that self-care can go a long, long way. So now hopefully you have seen our theme of water and you have seen that we have navigated through some of these uncharted waters. We've talked about the different types of stages of grief and loss. We've hopefully talked about resilience and have given you a couple of ideas for ways to develop a hands-on plan for moving forward and finishing out this semester strong. Um, in playing off of that imagery, now here I present to you a photo that has a, a few stepping stones across this little river. These are stepping stones that are small, but they're big enough for you to be able to take hold of and balance yourself until you get to the other side. And let me tell you, we are all going to get to the other side of this. Um, and with that, I would love to open this up for an opportunity for some questions or discussion. How does experiencing denial look different than being positive? That's a great question. Um, so denial is a real thing and it's an okay thing. But when we stay in denial for too long and we don't move into another state of being, that's where we can start to almost want to move to a shutdown mode. So I would say it's okay to have moments of denial. I'm living in moments of denial. And then um, we have to, to do some kind of work to move out of that denial. Whether And that's when you think about your coping strategies. What have you done before? Uh, what can you, could you do something to be mindful of your present um, and restructure? If you're having a hard time moving out of denial, reach out. Reach out to a friend that you trust. Reach out to a parent or a faculty member. And even just know it's okay if you're having a really hard time right now to reach out to a mental health provider. It That's part of being a good nurse too, is taking care of your mental health. And if you're really feeling stuck and you're struggling to find that positive, maybe reach out and get some, some professional help and that's okay too. How do we handle the fear that comes with knowing that we will one day in about a year be on the front lines of fighting deadly illnesses and pandemics like COVID-19? I think that that's a common feeling for the nurses that are currently working in the front line. I think that's a common feeling for all of us. Um, uh, I think a lot of that comes to knowing yourself and having that personal responsibility. We all were called to be a nurse. Many of you probably felt that calling early in life. Many of you are feeling that calling now as you are in clinical. If you're not feeling that calling, that's okay too. Um, but we have been called to do something that is higher than ourselves. And part of these challenging times and also part of nursing is being in situations that are a little scary at times. 
um, that's when we take a deep breath and we address that fear together. And I think it's okay to share that fear with, with others. Um, it's okay to acknowledge that fear that you might be feeling. And I think it's okay to have that sense of like, oh Lord, what did I get myself into when I chose nursing? I think arming yourself with knowledge and facts about this particular disease, this particular infection will help you um, navigate through that fear. When you are um, when you are able to know the facts of this disease head on, then that's when you know what you're dealing with in its entirety and you know how to fight that. So arm yourself with facts and take a deep breath and girl, be brave. What are some of your favorite coping me mechanisms? That's a, a great question. Um, I think one thing I want to preface this by saying is that each person copes differently. And so what works for me or what works for somebody else is not necessarily what works for you. Um, I know for myself, there's times where engaging in exercise is a helpful coping mechanism. And then there's other times where I just want to go lounge in my bed and read a book and not have to think about things. Um, and so it depends on the moment and it depends on what I feel I need at that time. Um, for me, a huge coping mechanism, especially in my early days as a nurse, was talking to my then fiance now husband about the struggles I was having and even if he wasn't listening he's a big gamer he might have been on his video games and but as long as I had an outlet to say my, the things I was feeling about I felt better after that so it's it's thinking about what's helped you in the past what are those things when you've had a rough time before what were those things that helped you then and use those now how do you suggest navigating hours of classroom work versus home life I find myself being exhausted by the end of the day and I don't have time for self-care. How do I navigate through that as well? Oh, I can feel your pain because I am exhausted as well. It is a lot um, right now because many times we are not alone in our houses now that we are quarantined. We might have parents, we might have siblings, we might have children of our own, but we might have people who are all competing for the technology. If there's only one computer or a few laptops in the house, we might have multiple people who are needing those resources to accomplish either work at home or school at home. So this is uh, this is the perfect time to be gentle to yourself. Um, this is not the perfect time to have uh, that sense of perfection and that everything is going to be perfect. That I'm going to, you know, come out of the semester perfectly. That I'm going to be you know, getting on my grades. We, we definitely want you to be successful, but I think it's okay for right now for you to make your expectations a little bit more realistic. Um, look at what your competing demands are. You are not in school right now during the most optimal time for your academic success. And I think it's okay to acknowledge that and say, you know what, this is not a perfect situation, but I am handling this the best I possibly can. And if you make a low B instead of what you're normally making as a high B or a low A, take it with a, with a bit of grace and say, I did the best I could and I'm gonna move on from this and it's still gonna be okay. How do we cope with the knowledge that we would be an asset to the extremely stretched medical teams in our hometowns, but are not necessarily able to do so with being pulled from clinicals? I want to echo again Dr. Kaler's things about grace. One of the things is that, um, you know, we need to acknowledge where we are right now. And a lot of you um, are at different stages in your nursing education. Some of you have maybe one semester left. Others of you have just started. Um, and yes, you would be an asset. But the reality is healthcare is going to continue well after this pandemic and you're going to be needed then too. So I think it's one of those things that pull from the front lines that we talked about can be very, very strong. But when the, you enter the healthcare workforce, your peers and colleagues at that time want you to be ready and fully equipped with what you need. And the reality is there's still some things that from an educator perspective, I know you still have to learn um, and your faculty still know you have to learn. So even though you can serve your hometown, keep in mind that you are at a phase in your life where you're going to be um, preparing yourself to be a full member 
of the healthcare system. If you're still feeling like you need to do more, then I would say reach out to that local healthcare system. Maybe it does. Maybe it's not time to go to the the front line, um, but what are those things that you could do to help if you feel that that calling? But keep in mind, your your future coworkers still want you to be academically successful. And so if if you feel like you need to go volunteer and help and your healthcare system's open to that, great, but don't let your grades suffer and don't let that infringe on your study time because healthcare needs you when you are ready to graduate. Is it okay that I am relieved that I am not a nurse during this pandemic? <laughs> I think so. I'm, I'm smiling at this because um, I've also felt a little bit of a sense of relief as well. And then that immediately made me feel guilty and it just started a whole cycle of my own personal emotions. But yes, I think that it is perfectly fine to feel a sense of relief. However, I challenge you because this is, uh, this is the perfect opportunity for uh, learning, right? So, so pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to the healthcare world. Find those credible resources and um, pay attention to how management and hospital organizations are dealing with this and handling this because you can use this as its own kind of real life case study. You might not be the nurse who's working at the bedside right now, but in a year or two years, you probably will. And is there anything that you can take from this experience that we're living through right now and you can apply that for your future nursing care? So that's what I would challenge you to do is kind of think about it from that way. And yes, it's okay to feel relieved. Do you have any tips on what to tell people when they ask us about the future of COVID-19? Yeah, I think it's definitely important. You know, many of you probably have already experienced this, that when someone hears that you're in nursing school, then suddenly you become the expert in all things medical, nursing, healthcare related. Um, so that's why I say it's important for you, then it comes with a responsibility. It's important for you to arm yourself with the facts and to be educated about this because you might be the one resource person that a neighbor or a friend um, can reach out to you knowing that you can give them credible information. So it goes back to patient education. In order to teach others, you have to fully know the content itself. So I think you do have a little bit of a professional responsibility to remain current and um, armed with facts about this uh, so that you can share that with others and also role model to others. Um, even though you're in school, people are looking up to you and people are looking to you for answers and you want to be able to supply them with good information and not perpetuate the problem of bad information. As an educator, how do you feel about students being pulled to the bedside without taking the NCLEX? How do I support my friends that are being pulled there? Great question. Um, so uh, last night we had a session similar to this for our students who are about to graduate and this came up a lot. And so I appreciate you wanting to care for your friends because we're hearing that from from that group that's about to to um, join the workforce and maybe be called to the bedside a few months before they were ready. One thing to keep in mind as you're supporting them is the fears that you guys are feeling about going to the bedside in the future, they're feeling right now. So uh, to be a support to them, maybe be that trusted person or that safe space for them to explore their fears. The other thing to know is um, and to encourage them to make sure that they know what their state is saying about this because each state and each board of nursing is approaching this a little bit differently. The reality is that everyone has to take an NCLEX at some point. It's maybe just not right now. They were probably, some states are letting them work under a temporary license and then they can start at the bedside. Um, but eventually they will have to take their NCLEX. So for, for those of you who that might be coming in, you know, a semester or so, or those friends of yours who are there close, encourage them to, you know, take the time now to make sure they keep studying for that. Uh, because the time to do that once they enter the workforce might be different, but they'll still have time. Um, but I think the other thing too, this is another moment, arm yourself with knowledge. Um, what is happening in your state where you plan to practice or encourage your friends to find out what's happening in the state they plan to practice and what does that look like for them? Because a lot of their questions might be due to just not knowing. With, without my clinical experiences, will I, how will I ensure I am ready for bedside practice? I think 
one thing to keep in mind is that this semester has not gone according to plan by anybody's standards as faculty um, from your perspective no none of this has gone according to plan but this is one piece of a long academic program uh, it takes more than one semester to become a nurse and so although this semester has changed i'm sure all of your faculty are trying to provide you meaningful alternate learning experiences so that you can still get the content Part of nursing is the skills. Yes, the starting the IV and the inserting the Foley catheter, but what makes a really good nurse is other things, the critical thinking and the knowledge and the prioritization of what's going on for your patients. So I think even though maybe you're not at the bedside, there's still a lot of learning that can occur. So embrace that, focus on what you can learn. Maybe in your mind, think about how you can apply that to future clinical experiences. And just know your faculty are aware of this. We're not under a disillusion that, oh, well, you'll be fine, you know, you didn't have these clinical experiences, they're going to try to make up for that in the future, too. We're going to try to seek out all of those meaningful learning experiences for you in the future, but right now, just take control of what you can make from this learning environment um, and arm yourself with as much knowledge so that when you get back to the bedside, you take full advantage of those opportunities. What can we expect summer classes to look like and fall classes to look like? A lot of what's going on right now is still navigating the unknown. And I think that that's going to be for true for you, true for your faculty, true for the administrators, and true for just the health of our nation right now. We don't know. We are taking, when it comes to the effects of this pandemic, we're taking it one day at a time, one week at a time. Unfortunately, we can't plan for one day at a time, one week at a time. And so plans have to be put in place for what summer semesters are going to look like and plans are being developed for what fall semesters are going to look like. This is where it might be unique to your specific institution. However, I feel strongly that our summer classes are very much going to be online. We're going to continue on with our remote learning and um, that's where the challenges of kind of self-motivation and keeping up with your own schedules and developing that self-directed learning is going to be so important to you. Um, fall 2020, we don't know. Nobody knows yet. But I can assure you this, that regardless of the unknown, steps are going to be put in place to get us all through to the other side of this and that we are going to get to the other side of this. Will faculty have sympathy towards students whose grades will be affected by COVID-19 and therefore affect preceptorships we receive? I think faculty are definitely mindful of um, everything that's going on, of the, the multiple stresses that students are experiencing and the multiple challenges that students are experiencing. Um, we are also experiencing similar challenges and similar stress, um, kind of from a compassionate standpoint, many of your faculty are navigating, trying to transition all of this online learning and trying to be there for you as much as possible, while also uh, dealing with spouses who are having to work from home, while dealing with children who are here 100% of the time constantly. I was joking the other day that now can I please, now that school is out for the rest of the semester, can I please put pre-K education and fifth grade education on my resume because now I'm having to homeschool my own children and they're driving me crazy. So I think I think that yes, your faculty are going to be understanding of you. However, I do want to caution you to not use that as a crutch because the academic standards are still going to be maintained. Um, the nobody is lowering their standards of you of the nursing program. Um, the NCLEX is not going to magically get easier just because we went through a pandemic. So the standards are still going to be set, but yes, I think a lot of grace and a lot of understanding is going to be set forth. It's just going to be your responsibility to let your faculty member know of your unique situations. I am in my second year of nursing school and I am struggling at this time. This disease and these working conditions are scaring me. How do I, how do I get through this difficult time and how do I know that nursing is still the profession for me? That's a Valid point. I think a lot of, I mean, for everybody, this is scary. Um, I don't think there's a single person out there that, um, you know, has the Superman and vulnerability to the, the fear that's out there. So I want you just, again, 
know that it's okay to be scared. And if you're having questions about this, if this fear of the unknown or just what's going on out there, if you're having a hard time navigating that, reach out to your faculty members. Um, let them be that trusted person. And maybe it's not the faculty member who's teaching you this semester. Maybe you don't have that same relationship, um, but maybe there is a faculty member from semesters before who you felt really safe confiding in and going to. Reach out to them. Um, a lot of times we need a sounding board. That's one of the ways that we process grief is through verbal uh, reactions. And so use them as a resource to help you think through all of those things that you're feeling. They've been at the front lines. They have that experience. Maybe they're not there now, but they've had other experiences where they've had, they've cared for patients with infectious disease. Um, so reach out to them, use them as a resource. Have you heard from anyone who's recently taken the NCLEX and, ha and as to how the reg new regulations went? I, I have not, um, to be honest with you. Um, I know that a lot of times right now, because of social distancing and the stay-at-home mandates, a lot of the NCLEX centers and testing centers around the country are closed right now, and NCLEX um, testing dates are being postponed to whenever um, these mandates are being lifted. I um, have not personally heard from any unique stories or experiences of students who've recently taken the test um, with the new mandates, uh, but I think it would be definitely something worth reaching out to somebody from a previous semester who has been there and done that, who might be able to kind of offer insight into that. I just want to thank our presenters so much today for all this great information. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with this audience, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. As a reminder to the attendees, please submit the state or country you are from. Also, you can contact Dr. Lippy or Dr. Kaler for additional information if you need to. And thank you to our attendees for joining us. Have a wonderful day.